measuring the speed of the glacier over several years to determine whether it's speeding up or slowing down. To do this, they fire a laser survey gun at reflective targets, which they place on the surface of the ice. that hovers a few inches above the glacier, O'Neill positions the target onto the ice. Pfeffer locks onto the target and shoots a laser that reflects back to the stationary gun, recording the position. I got it, you're good. Come on back. Okay, first one down. 1.1 kilometers away. The target moves with the ice. By tracking its movement with the laser over several days, they'll be able to calculate the speed of the Columbia. Just down the fjord, Baylog and extreme ice survey engineer Adam LeWinter climbed down to one of the time-lapse cameras they installed a year ago. Oh, yes, here it is. Still all there? Yeah, the camera's here, but nice. what happened to the glacier? When I was here a year ago, the calving face was just right there. All right, we have pictures. It's a revelation. Every time we, we open up these boxes and download these images and bring them up on the computer and play them back, your, your eyes are popping out of your head. Although carving is normal, the Columbia is losing ice so quickly that in the last 30 years, the glacier has receded 16 kilometers up the fjord. Baylog's time-lapse images capture a rate of retreat that shows no sign of stopping. In the last year alone, the Columbia lost another kilometer of ice. I really never expected that we were going to see changes of anything like this kind of magnitude in the period of time we had to work on this. This rapid carving of the Columbia is a symptom of its decline, but it's poorly understood. If Pfeffer and O'Neill can figure out what's causing it to carve more ice, it may help them predict the glacier's future. They're taking a curious tack by using earthquake technology to crack open the mystery of the ice. They're installing seismometers that pick up the vibrations of ice quakes, tremors that reverberate through the ice as it carves. From the seismic data, a pattern emerges that points to one clear culprit, water. They knew water was melting the ice, but it appears it's prying the ice apart like a powerful lever. You can hear meltwater running right now and it's all getting stuck in the glacier. And if you have a fracture with high pressure water in it, it can ratchet the, the crack open. The seismic record confirms that the carving events have the unique signatures of fractures caused by water. As rising temperatures create more surface melting, the water pours into the cracks in the glacier and wedges it apart. The result is increased carving and a quicker demise of the glacier. Oh, there's a big one coming up from underneath. There it is. Baylog is seeing this powerful fracturing effect firsthand as the fjord below comes alive. That basal ice has come up from the very bottom of the glacier, that, that dark blue out there. As the ice and the snow are squeezed together, the air gets driven out of it. And so the color becomes more and more pure. The air bubbles are what make it white. 
And so when the base of the glacier breaks up, you get these fantastic sapphires and turquoises boiling up out of nowhere, you know, and that's what these bergs are. After several days of laser tracking, Tad Pfeffer knows how fast the Columbia is moving. 16 meters a day, eight times faster than it was 30 years ago. Go back to 1980. Here on this bedrock, we had ice above us 1,500 feet. Look at the trim line over there. That's where the ice surface was in 1980. And all of that volume is lost because this calving is so fast and snowfall upstream isn't resupplying it. So in that sense, yeah, it's going too fast and the glacier is kind of collapsing. Pfeffer suspects that the Columbia is long past its tipping point and it's only a matter of time before it withers away entirely. This kind of ice is called dead ice. It's no longer part of the living active glacier. It's stranded up on the side of the ice stream and it's melting away and collapsing. And as it does that, all the erosional debris that's on the top continues to concentrate until you have this ice covered in blackness. I'm really interested in the mortality of the glacier right here. There's something very rich and very intense about the, the changing landscape. You know, I feel the, the, the end, I feel the death right here. The problem is, it's not just the Columbia that's on its way out. Glaciers everywhere, across the Rockies, Andes, Alps, and Himalayas, are in their death throes. The consensus is that in the next 50 to 100 years, mountain glaciers almost everywhere will simply disappear. From the loss of mountain glaciers alone, sea levels will rise by almost 30 centimeters, displacing millions of people around the world. But the biggest cost will be the loss of these huge natural reservoirs of fresh water. Water on which one-sixth of the world's population depends. The hardest hit will be in Asia, where nearly a billion people get their drinking water from Himalayan glaciers. The abrupt collapse of the world's mountain glaciers raises even more disturbing questions about the Earth's biggest tracts of ice the polar ice sheets of Antarctica and Greenland. The real wild cards are what the big ice sheets are going to do. We're already seeing the Greenland ice sheet start to behave in rather disturbing ways. We're playing with fire, if you will, when it comes to the ice sheets. We don't know whether if we get these big, massive freight train-like beasts going, whether we can stop them. The potential for the polar ice sheets to flood the planet is staggering. If all of Greenland and Antarctica were to melt, the oceans would rise 60 meters. But over geological time, these ancient bulwarks of ice have withstood many periods of climate warming. Until a few years ago, scientists...